Welcome to our second of two videos on models for text classification. Today we will modify our model from the previous video to include the more advanced architectures discussed in video 3.3. Most of the video will be spent walking through the code additions for our model. We'll also get a sneak peek at some of the plot it produces in TensorBoard, a topic that will be discussed in detail in the next section. Without further ado, let's begin. Okay, and today we start off with our model function from last time. The only difference between this version and what we saw in the previous video is contained between the outputs of our embedding layer and the inputs for our logic. In other words, the RNN portion. First, we'll define a function deep LSTM, seen here, that will build a multi-layer LSTM. The easiest way to build multi-layer RNNs is to use TensorFlow's multi-RNN cell, which accepts a list of cells as its input and will chain them one after the other. For training, we'll also wrap each individual layer's LSTM with a dropout wrapper and set its state keep prob to 0 0.5. This means that any time inputs are fed through a given cell layer, every unit in that cell has a 50% chance of being dropped. In practice, a unit being dropped means that its output is set to zero for that particular input. In other words, it just isn't used. Also, as a small detail, the output units for that layer that aren't dropped are scaled by one over state keep prob, which for us is equal to two, so that the expected sum is unchanged. There are many interesting interpretations of dropout, and you can think of it as a form of regularization, a topic we'll discuss in detail in the next section. Note that you typically don't want to imply dropout for any mode other than training, since in those cases we will want to use all of our model's units to get a fair evaluation. Said another way, dropout ensures that our model doesn't rely on only a few units for any prediction, which can lead to overfitting. Instead, we force it to spread out the representations it learns over many units. One last thing before moving on. Although multi-RNN cell subclasses RNN cell, it absolutely does not have the same kind of outputs as your standard RNN cell. And that can be very confusing to find out since this isn't given much recognition in the documentation. As we'll see when we continue through the code, there are additional steps we'll need to take when working with multi-RNN cells that we wouldn't otherwise have to take. So in preparation of creating a bidirectional RNN, we'll need to specify what to use for the forward RNN and also the backward RNN. In nearly all cases, you'll just build the same architecture twice, one for the forward and one for the backward RNN. The only exception is if you're feeling fancy for whatever reason and want to experiment with mixing architectures, but that's not a very common thing to do. Next, we'll feed the, each of these into the bidirectional dynamic RNN function. As you'd expect, this uses the same flavor of implementation as dynamic RNN, but for bidirectional RNNs. We feed in the embedded features and get back a tuple containing outputs and output states, which are the same names given by the documentation and also shown above in my comments. The next part is where we'll need to be careful or things can quickly get frustrating. So the documentation says the outputs itself, by outputs I'm talking specifically about outputs the object, will be a tuple containing the forward and backward RNN output tensors for each size shape, batch size by max time, which for us is max sequence length, by cell.output size. The last part there is technically not true for multi-RNN cells because the value of a multi-RNN cell output size is an integer, which gives the number of units for each subcell that we've passed in. So it'll be something like 256 for us, which is the default state size. However, multi-RNN cell outputs are actually tuples, with length equal to the number of layers, the ith element being the outputs for the ith layer. The same idea is true for handling the returned output states object too. And we'll see how to handle this kind of strange exception when dealing with multi-RNN cells. Accordingly, we'll begin by first explicitly unpacking the output states tuple into output state forward and output state backward. Each of these is a multi-RNN cell output state, which means each of these two is itself a tuple of length equal to the number of layers, which we've either specified on the command line as num layers, or it is using the default value of 3, which is set by me in the arc parser object at the top of the file. So what do we do next? We have the forward and backward multi-RNN cell states, and we need to combine them to pass on as a single tensor to the next layer. We'll do this by first concatenating the states for each layer together, for both the forward RNN and the backward RNN separately. Then we'll concatenate the resulting forward and backward state together to obtain the final result. That first step is done with the help of our concat LSTM functions, function, which is right here, which returns an LSTM state tuple containing the concatenated memory state C and hidden state H. The input to this function is a list of LSTM states, and remember that the state of an LSTM cell object is represented as an LSTM state tuple. So many tuples. I strongly encourage that you slowly walk through this code yourself and make sure you understand each step. It will save you a lot of time trying to understand the rather confusing errors that can be output otherwise. 
And note how to concatenate all these this list of LSTMs here, you have to separately get the state C in the LSTMs list and also the state H. Uh, it's not as straightforward as simply calling a concat on that. It's something you can do, but it's going to look a lot more obscure. Uh, this is a much more readable approach to concatenating LSTM lists. And so we call the concat LSTM on both the output state forward and output state backward. And in the final step here, we concatenate just the hidden state H for each of the combined forward and backward states, since we almost never want to pass on the memory state C to subsequent layers. We could have ignored or just omitted. We could have really put anything here in the memory state C. For correctness, we've actually used it, but it's not being passed on, so something to keep in mind. And after that, it's the same code as before. We project the number of classes to obtain our logits and proceed as usual. You may recall that at the end of our main function, we looped over train and evaluate calls with our classifier. Let's now see some of the plots that are generated as a result of those calls. Let's look at a couple of the plots from TensorBoard, a TensorFlow utility for creating line plots, histograms, visualizing your graph, and more. First, we see a plot of our model's loss function for both the training data, orange, and the evaluation data, blue. The horizontal axis shows the number of training steps, and the vertical axis is the value of the loss function. Of course, we want to minimize our loss function, so we're glad to see the orange line decrease with time. But we also observe a phenomenon known as overfitting, which is when the model essentially starts just memorizing the training data set to decrease the loss, rather than learning useful general representations of the data. A good sign that you're overfitting is when you start to see your evaluation loss, which for us is the blue curve, stop decreasing and beginning to go up again. At this point, we probably should have stopped training and modified some hyperparameters, but this serves as a useful illustration of the training and evaluation loss curves in the presence of overfitting. Next is the prediction accuracy plots. Again, training is orange and evaluation is blue. Our prediction accuracy reaches just under 100% by step 2000 or so, and that's exactly where we observed clear overfitting to begin in the previous plot. Thereafter, neither training nor evaluation accuracy improves much. This is just a sneak peek at TensorBoard usage, and we'll be devoting an entire video to it in the next section. So stay tuned for that. That marks the end of section 3. We've covered some of the foundational concepts for natural language processing with deep learning, such as word embeddings, recurrent neural networks, and advanced architecture variations for RNNs. We've also applied all of these to the task of text classification on the 20 news group dataset, and learn some additional TensorFlow materials such as TF records formatting along the way. As always, make sure to read through the links here for an in-depth look at the topics covered today. In the next section, we'll explore various tips and tricks to know about when working with TensorFlow, such as getting the most out of TensorBoard, debugging strategies, and a lot more. See you next time!